Thank you very much, Sam and Mark, for that reading, and good morning, everyone. I'd like to talk a little bit in general this morning about Proverbs. We'll make a few allusions to that chapter we just read, but I'm not going to specifically talk on that as a theme. And then we'll look at one particular theme through Proverbs. I don't know about you, but I struggle a bit when reading Proverbs, uh, though it's slowly growing on me. The first nine chapters are not too bad. Um, there's this advice to a son about wisdom. There's a very vivid comparison of the two women, the, the one that represents good and one that represents bad, the wise and the foolish, the moral and the adulterous. And it's easy to see that that gives us some guidance into the way we should live and the way we shouldn't live easy to see it's not so easy to put it into action of course but when we get to chapter 10 the the start of Solomon's wise sayings the next 22 chapters the first uh, 12 or 13 of them Solomon sayings and the last nine other wise sayings are all very similar to each other they're a collection of not very closely related proverbs and they don't seem to be grouped in any sequence in general. In most of our reading of scripture, we use context to inform our thoughts. We know the context of the chapter we're reading and that helps us enormously to understand the main point. But when we get to Proverbs like the chapter we read, we run into a problem. There's a blur of ideas, aren't there? So many that... I don't know about you, but I tend to get sort of confused. And no amount of effort will help us to see an overall pattern in a chapter like that because there just isn't one. To read Proverbs and to make sense of it, we need a different kind of context than the context of the chapter. The context we need is some understanding of the idea of Proverbs in Old Testament times. And Brother Mark Vincent, in one of his articles, gives us some guidelines to use in understanding them I found quite interesting. He said, first of all, Proverbs teach general truths and are not universally true. And we'll come across this idea, of some of the ideas in Proverbs not being true quite a number of times in this talk. And at first it seems strange, but not when we look at it closely. His second guideline is that some proverbs show different aspects of the same topic. They may seem almost contradictory. And his third is that we are meant to compare proverbs with one another. And the fourth is that they use pictorial language and it's obviously not literally true. And the final one is that the, they're, they're meant to be catchy and memorable and that's pretty obvious. So I thought I'd just pick out a few proverbs to illustrate these guidelines to help us. The first one, they teach general truths and are not universally true. Well, in verse 12 that we read, uh, let a man meet a bear robbed of her cubs rather than a fool in his folly. It's not universally true. I would rather meet a fool than be mauled by a man-eating bear. It's not meant to be literally true. It's a vivid exaggeration. It's made to make the point that associating with fools is not a good idea. In fact, it's a dangerous idea. In Proverbs chapter 10 and 22, we read, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow with it. Now, all of us here, I expect, have sorrows in our lives. That is just not literally true of us all in a universal and specific sense. But we would also say we're greatly blessed, perhaps not in physical things, but in spiritual things right now. And that's why we're here. So it's not true in a specific sense, but it is true in an ultimate sense. Ultimately, God blesses us with great spiritual gifts and in the kingdom with incredible gifts. And we need to see past the literal words to the real meaning that's behind it. In verse 27 of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord prolongs days, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. 
It's another proverb that isn't always true. Not all who fear God live long lives. Not in this life. So we clearly need to understand the proverb is talking about a more general kind of thing. It's talking about the fact that in the ultimate, God holds out a life of the kingdom to those that fear him that's so much above the life hope of someone who is wicked. The second guideline was that proverbs sometimes show different aspects of a topic. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 4 says... Where no oxen are, the trough is clean, but much increase comes from the strength of an ox. So are oxen good or bad? Well, it depends. We're presented with a paradox, aren't we? If you want clean surroundings and no fuss, you don't have to feed them, you don't have to muck up their stalls, having no oxen is a really good idea. But if you want to plough your field, if you want some hard lifting done, having oxen is a good idea. I mean, the modern equivalent is tractors, I suppose. You know, having a tractor is an expensive uh, thing to have and you've got to maintain it and you've got to feed it diesel and so on. You'd be much better off without it. But if you want to play our field, you're much better off with a tractor than a hoe and a shovel. Then there's a third guideline, that we should compare and contrast proverbs to get the full picture. And this is... I think, really special for us. It's a great scriptural principle that applies to all scripture. If we don't do this, we don't get the God's full truth, but a biased version. Often we end up with what we want rather than what God wants. Len Richardson has a great book on this theme, Balancing the Book, which someone drew to my attention a couple of months ago. And he says... It's not enough to get a truth. You've got to get the whole of God's truth. And to do that, we need to look through all the scripture in a topic and compare them to get the richest truth that God wants to give us. Paul, in his letters in the New Testament, often uses a Greek word, sophron, which is sometimes translated temperance. And it's got nothing to do with not drinking alcohol. It's much more to do with sober or serious evaluation of a subject or balance, and it's one of his favourite words, and I must admit I find it very valuable to think about it. In other words, we should never decide a scripture, any scriptural issue, on just one quote, or we will be on very dangerous ground. An example of this comparison in Proverbs is one that someone brought to my attention when I was a teenager and I still remember it. I was at university and he was trying to prove that the Bible couldn't possibly be God's word. And it was Proverbs chapter 26 and verses 4 and 5. And verse 4 of Proverbs 26 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly. And the next verse says, Answer a fool according to his folly. Now, has the wise man made a mistake? The two don't seem on the surface to be able to be right. But they can be right in the right context. It depends on the situation. And it's important to realise that there's no rule for conversation, especially with fools. We need to be empathetic to who we're talking about, to their mood, whether they're likely to listen, and what the subject is. There's no one rule for how you should answer every conversation. And that's what Proverbs is trying to point out. The NIV says of these two verses, do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. And the next verse, answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. That's the difference. The first one is concentrating on the effect it will have on you. And the second one, the effect it will have on the fool. In other words, the context will determine it. If you know this particular person, they are always foolish, they're never ever going to change, then don't answer them according to their folly. You'll just make yourself look like a fool too and you're not going to ever change their mind. But if you know this person, you think he's saying something that's a bit foolish, but he's not normally like that then answer a fool according to his folly. Talk about what he's saying to you 
and see if you can improve his understanding. And that's what those two sayings in Proverbs mean. It's not a mistake. It's making us understand that rules for our life have to be influenced by the circumstances of our life. There's another one in the New Testament that you may have noticed in Galatians chapter 6. Verse 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfil the law of Christ. And three verses later it says, For each one shall bear his own burden. So what do we do? Do we bear other people's burdens or we just bear our own? Now, the context in that chapter sort of explains it all. It's two slightly different Greek words, but we don't need Greek. We need to understand what Galatians 6 and the whole of Galatians is about. It's about salvation. And if we're talking about your salvation or my salvation, we have to bear our own load. I have to decide whether I'm going to serve God or not. I have to be baptised. I have to commit to serving and following Christ. And you can't do it for me and I can't do it for you. And in that sense, we each have to bear our own burden. But once we've committed to Christ and we're trying to follow Christ's example, as followers of Christ, we would never see our brother or sister struggling and not try to help them, help them share that burden. And it's a fairly obvious kind of thing. We, we're not at all phased by the differences because we know those differences depend on the different circumstances and what the particular quote is actually talking about. The guideline about Proverbs being pictorial language is pretty obvious. Proverbs chapter 10 says good words people are, good words, good people's words are nice. But it doesn't actually say it like that. It says the tongue of the righteous is choice silver. Now if I said uh, good people's words are nice, you would probably have forgotten it by the end of the meeting and certainly by after lunch this afternoon. But if we think about that, the tongue of the righteous is choice silver, that's a memorable picture and it is engraved on our minds. Now it's clearly not true, good people don't have metal tongues, but they have silver tongues. It's not even true that they have valuable tongues. What it is, is good people say words that are really worth listening to. But even though it's not true, it's a beautiful picture to help us remember that important point. The tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. Uh, later in chapter 10, the lips of the righteous feed many. It's another vivid picture. You know, good people's words inspire us and encourage us, I suppose, is what it means. But it's not lips feeding people. Lips doesn't, don't feed everyone. Even words don't feed people. They encourage people. So we need to understand that when we look at the Proverbs and they make so much more sense. And the last one, of course, the, the style is catchy and that's almost true of everything we read in Proverbs, isn't it? So when we take these ideas on board with Proverbs, Proverbs becomes a rich and a valuable guide to our lives. But it only becomes that rich when we work at it, when we compare the Proverbs with other Proverbs, when there are the New Testament quotes. And this comparing is a marvellous educational process. It seems to me that this is the point of Proverbs, to make us think hard, because this is exactly what we have to do in real living in Christ. In real life now, we have to think hard how to apply Christ's teaching to any particular everyday circumstance. And sometimes we have two or three different teachings of Christ that come to mind. We have to work out what is it that really what Christ would like us to do in this situation? And it seems to me that that is the real point of Proverbs, that our lives should be about comparing what we know of Christ and his message and God's message and trying to put it into practice in the practical living of our lives. And sometimes that's not also always so obvious. An example of a proverb where the New Testament comparison is Proverbs 10, verse 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Now, as soon as we hear that last bit, we think of Peter's statement in 1 Peter 4. Above all things, have fervent love for one another, 
for love will cover a multitude of sins. And I think Peter had that proverb in mind when he said that. There's another idea I found handy given to us by Brother Len Richardson in one of his writings on Proverbs. He said we should look for three applications, the literal, the metaphorical and the spiritual. And when I read that I thought, well, you know, what's that all mean? So he gave an example which I rather like, Proverbs 14 verse 1, the wise woman builds her house but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. Wise woman builds a house, the foolish pulls it down with her hands. The literal is obvious. A wise woman living in a house doesn't destroy it, maintains it and keeps it in good care. The metaphorical is when the house stands not for a literal building, but probably for the family. And a wise woman can build a strong and healthy family by her words and her deeds and her example. And the foolish one can do the opposite. And the spiritual applies more generally to us perhaps when the house stands for the ecclesia of Christ and we if we are wise can be constructive and encouraging in the ecclesia in Christ or if we're selfish and foolish we can destroy this ecclesia of Christ <coughs> we had another example in Proverbs 17 that we read in verse 3 the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold but the Lord tests the hearts. Now the literal is clear, you have to have a refining pot if you want to purify silver. The metaphorical is reasonably clear too. The testing is the everyday hardship experiences that people have in their lives, some rather more than others as we know. And these, if they're handled well, can strengthen our character. And we don't go looking for these trials. So the potter is a metaphor for us in our everyday lives and the trials that we'll inevitably come across. And the spiritual is that in our spiritual life we'll also have spiritual trials. And we can, with God's help, use them to increase our spiritual perception, to help us understand suffering and perhaps even understand better the suffering of Christ for us. Another example in the chapter we read was the verse before it, verse 2. A wise servant will rule over her son who causes shame and will share an inheritance among the brothers. The literal is a wise servant's making sensible and caring and fair decisions. Now the metaphorical is that the servant stands, I guess, for anyone in a position of some kind of authority and decision making in life, in work or in whatever avenue of our lives. They have a responsibility to be sensitive and to be fair in their relations with those that they work with or they're living with. And the spiritual application of this, the servant stands for those in the ecclesia with areas of service and responsibility which is after all, all of us really, isn't it? And we need to be sensitive and fair and wise in our dealings with each other. And perhaps ultimately the spiritual stands for the ultimate servant, who is Christ. So they're the kinds of principles that I found valuable when I was thinking about how I should use Proverbs. The particular theme I'd like to just touch on briefly now is that of speech. And you saw that beautiful meditation song that Julia picked on that. The way we communicate is crucial to our lives. It's, I think, one of the ways we're made in God's image, that we can talk to each other. So now I'd look, like to look and compare just a few of the many proverbs that talk about speech and the tongue. And to help us in our walk, we'll see if we can apply the principles we've talked about. Let's start with verse 20 of the chapter we read. Chapter 17, he who has a deceitful heart finds no good. <coughs> and he who has a perverse tongue falls into evil. It's a warning straight away. The tongue can be a very negative and evil thing. So that's the first point about speech. We've got to be careful. In Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 14, we read another proverb about speech. 
Wise people store up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. Wise don't talk much, but fools do. Perhaps I should sit down straight away. <clears throat> this tells us another ne negative aspect of the tongue. Sometimes too much talk isn't very good. And yet, in that same chapter, in verse 20, the tongue of the righteous is choice silver, the heart of the wicked is worth little. So one says, don't talk, and the other says, what you say is really valuable, so you should be talking. And again, we have two proverbs saying seemingly the opposite. And we have to think, which one applies in this circumstance right now in my life? So we have the paradox of contrasting ideas that forces us to stop and think and see how we can apply scripture in our own practical lives. Also, that verse mentions that speech can be an index of the heart. So we need to keep our heart right and reflect this heart in our speech. This idea of good and bad in the tongue comes out in Christ's words in Matthew 12 where he said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. This idea of balance. And it's shown clearly in Proverbs 18 and verse 21 where we read, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. The tongue can kill you or make you alive. That's a pretty big contrast, isn't it? Two opposing ideas. Proverbs 12 and verse 18 says the same kind of thing. There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. So what we say can wound us or heal us. It's up to us to choose carefully if we want to wound or heal our brothers, our sisters, our family members, our work colleagues. We've got to be very careful, don't we, about what we say and how we say it. One that you're very familiar with, I'm sure, verse, first verse of Proverbs 15, a soft answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. This Proverbs honing in on what's the aim of what we say. Are we trying to calm things down, turn away wrath, or to stir up anger? Is what we say aimed at moderation and sweet reasonless? Or is our speech quick judgment without thinking, shouting, table thumping, biting sarcasm? These latter have no place in any kind of persuasive speech and they'll put off any reasonable person. They won't persuade them to follow Christ. <coughs> As Proverbs 25.11 says... A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. <coughs> Excuse me. I've got remains of some asthma on me. Probably me. Now, I don't know what apples of gold in settings of silver is. Perhaps you could enlighten me. I haven't found a satisfactory explanation in a commentary. But I think we get a kind of a picture. Words fitly spoken are like some kind of beautiful ornament. They're lovely to see and lovely to hear. And Peter says in 1 Peter 4, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Now there's a challenge for our speaking, isn't it? Is everything we say as the oracles of God. In Proverbs 6, Solomon speaks about the things the Lord hates. And he says... The six things the Lord hates, seven are an abomination to him. And listen to them and think about how much is about speech. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, that might be, feet that are swift in running evil, that might be, a false witness who speaks lies definitely is, and one who sows discord amongst his brethren. Three of them are definitely about how we talk out of seven. And five out of seven probably have something to do with our conversation and the way we speak. These are the things God hates. So we want to be careful we don't do them. Similarly, at the very last chapter of Proverbs, Lemuel speaks about the woman who is a virtuous woman. And I'm sure it applies to a virtuous man too. 
And right near the end of the book, he says, she opens her mouth with wisdom and on her tongue, <coughs> excuse me, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. Now there's a law we don't hear much about, I don't think. When did you hear the law of kindness mentioned from the platform or by someone to you in your conversation? On her tongue is the law of kindness. That's a real challenge, I think, to our speaking in our conversation. The truth should make us kind, not belligerent. And it should re be reflected in our kind tongue. Regardless of how others talk to us or about us, ours should always be a, a tongue with a law of kindness on it. Paul says the same idea in Colossians 4, and it's, it's a proverb in a way, I think. It's very vivid. He says, let your speech always be with grace seasoned with salt, that you may now know how you ought to answer one another. It's a cooking metaphor. Your speech should like, be like a meal that's got all the right seasons and flavours in it to make it beautiful. And the most important of the seasonings for your meal is grace. Let your speech always be with grace. I'd like to close with one proverb that doesn't relate to speech or the tongue as we approach the emblems. And it's Proverbs 27, verse 6, which says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And that certainly brings us to the emblems and the wounds of our friend Jesus and the reason that we are here. It goes on to say that the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Now that brings us to think as Jesus possibly did, I don't know, in this proverb of Judas in the garden. I hope in this quick look at Proverbs you can see first but here in this scripture, this book of scripture, the whole truth is found by balancing the scripture, by searching and comparing, and by understanding the context. And if we are to do this, we'll find a real treasure trove in this book. And second, I hope that we can remember that communication by our tongues is a precious gift, and we need to use it in such a way and not misuse it. We need to constantly think when we speak. James chapter 3 says, Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Fortunately before us we have these emblems, the perfect example for us in every aspect of our lives, the perfect example of the way we should speak, and the way we should act. As Peter said in 1 Peter 2, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed.